A normal lost phone is a 2017 puzzle video game developed by Accidental Queens, published by Pladius and Plugin Digital, and fits neatly into that space of clever indie game. The game presents you with a mobile phone screen with no identifying information about you, yourself, and gives you the explanation that you're holding a phone that is a normal phone that was lost. It's there in the title. What you get from there is a sort of contained sleuthing game, where you, interacting with an entirely reasonable phone, protected by entirely reasonable safeguards and protections, try to work out who owns the phone, why it's lost, and what you should do with it. Given that the game is functionally one long-form puzzle, with a single fixed set of solutions and very little branching storytelling, I should warn you that talking about what's in the game will by necessity tell you what's in the game, obviously. I'm not going to be able to give you a clear vision of the game's mouthfeel or whatever, or talk about how the jump is floaty. Talking about a normal lost phone is a process of talking about all that there is in a normal lost phone. So consider this a spoiler warning, even after our content warnings. And uh, yeah, those... Those sure were those. Still... If you saw this game on Itch or Steam and thought, hey, that looks interesting, I wonder what very smart and cool video game thinky person Talon Lee has to say about it, I'd like to first offer up that I like it, that I had a violent reaction to playing it, that I cheated to finish it, and that I'm super happy for that. There's your warning, there's your pause, now let's go. First up, the fact that it is a normal phone almost feels like it's being sarcastic, but it's very much not. This is a phone that has completely typical apps on it, things that you would be familiar with if you have a phone of your own. That's kind of an interesting question just on the face of it. Like, how do you correctly communicate to someone the honest and sincere truth that you're not trying to pull a fast one here? That it's not haunted or enchanted, especially in the indie space where there's a certain tendency towards both horror and magical realism. No, this is a normal phone, and this is... I almost would want to call it the indie version of Oscar bait. It's cleverly executed, it's slickly put together, it uses a thematic space to work with that allows for a lot of interesting drama and storytelling. The storytelling takes on forms that make the kind of story it's telling more interesting, where definitionally you're getting kind of rashomoned over time by multiple different characters, and at least one of those characters is also another one of those characters at the same time. There is a body of thinking that queer narrative is narrative that has to be about a particular set of the queer experience, and this is a really good example of that kind of queer narrative. The phone, central to a normal lost phone, is the phone of a young trans woman who on her 18th birthday decided to get on her motorbike and get out of town, leaving behind everything that she had. This ultimately hopeful story beat is then only given to you at the very end of your investigation, while you are snaking your way through multiple different competing narratives about what's going on in her life up to that point. When you first experience it, you're given a gender ambiguous name, and then you have to work your way through messages to try and deduce what you can about this person, about their family, and about the things that have been happening in their life. Just as one minor clever note about this, how do you stop this kind of game from being enormous and sprawling and incredibly difficult with all the information in it. Sam's only had this phone for two months, so the history only goes back two months. So you have the way that the queer narrative allows for a multi-dimensional identity of the narrator, and the way that the interface allows you to show that through how the narrator treats other people. This is just so beautifully clever. You need a story like this to take place over time. 
because there are questions of identity and there are questions of reflection. Experiences that Sam has are contextualized as you go through the narrative with her by revelations of what she's trying, what she's doing, how long has she known, how long has she been considering this element of herself and of her identity. It's really, really good. Another detail is that you couldn't really pick through this kind of information on a seriously secure person's life. The passwords in Sam's life are all extremely convenient, and you could extrapolate them from paying attention to the messages that are publicly available. The entire thread of narrative spools out because you can read her messages, and everything else flows from there. But also, Sam's a 17-year-old when you start? She's not super security conscious. She doesn't have any reason to think anyone would be cracking her phone, and the things that she's doing to make her phone secure are really effective at that low stakes. A mother is not going to notice the kinds of things she's using as her passwords, because why would she be paying attention to those things? So the type of phone it is, the type of person who has it, and the type of environment the phone is used for all play together to be part of the storytelling. This is so good. There's also a dramatic tension to the queerness of the piece, which is... Like, you're not meant to say it, but in the LGBTQ community, there is definitely a tiering system for the kinds of things stories get to be told about. The more palatable you are, the more layers of privilege that you have existing acceptance around you. That kind of thing. Gay men usually get to be at the top of a heap, whereas photogenic gay women, a little below that, and so on and so forth. As one of the B in that acronym, I don't get to show up on the hierarchy at all. The narrative of the story first leaves you a red herring thinking that maybe Sam is a het boy who has done something terrible. Then you get the possibility that Sam is gay. And then it expands further and you realize that Sam is trans. And that arcing easing you in means that for a start, discovering that no, in fact, Sam was getting yelled at by a transphobe is enormously relieving and then galvanizing. I went from being worried that I was going to be too sympathetic to someone who had done something terrible to suddenly railing against this other person who was attacking her. How dare you hurt Sam? How dare you bring your petty transphobia into a board game club? You monster. Another element of this that I am just a little bit too old to connect to too directly is the way that the queer experience is lived on the internet in a little metal box. I'm of a generation that got our start on the internet in the 90s. Queer media was done on hidden subfolders on a shared computer and you sweated bullets. You got very familiar at navigating things like cached directories that Windows used with multiple dollar signs in the name because no one looked there. And you could get better at things like zip passwords and whatnot if you had to use the tiny amount of space you had. You were secure through obscurity. These days, there are people who live their lives on the internet who don't have computers, or at least don't have what you think of when you think of a computer. They don't have a laptop or a desktop computer. They have their phone. Sam lives her life through her phone. The game shows you these ribboning threads of a life lived through this one point of interface. But crucially, how all of those threads connect to people. There is this you always on your phone thinking that people, even of my generation, and definitely of my parents' generation, think of the young people who are using smartphones with this idea of like, oh, you're using your phone too much. For what? To talk to people? You are talking to too many people. You are talking to people on your phone at a distance too much. It's a weird idea because I don't ever think my parents would have said, you have too many pen pals, or you're spending too much time at the soccer club talking with everyone there. The interface makes it mysterious. 
And yes, there can definitely be problems when someone is in, say, a bad social space and being bullied or harassed or pushed into things they don't want to do through their phone. But those things can happen in material relationships as well. And that opens up another dimension that can make things even more unsafe. Instead, the people who don't understand what it's like to live your life in a little box see the bone as the problem and not as the tool, the gateway it is to a vast and greater part of your life. I really like Sam. I don't know that much about her. She's talented as a musician and she's got direction in her life and she wants to do cool things and she has a bunch of queer supportive friends. And that's really sweet and that's really good. And I'm gunning for her. I want her to do well. I think the weirdest thing for me is that this is one of the first times playing a game of this ilk where I was able to recognize that generational divide of a life that was nonetheless similar to mine. I did not think, oh wow, she's like me. I thought, Oh wow, I have students her age. I've never thought of myself as a elder queer, and I'm certainly not good at it. But this game made me, for a moment, look at the phone and think, I'm going to do whatever I can to make things right for this kid. This kid, who is an adult, it's a plot point that she's an adult. With this sense of emotional urgency, then, I want to talk about why I stopped playing this game and why I had a violent reaction. The game goes through a very simple arc of problem, answer, problem, answer kind of investigation. You start out unable to access email because you don't have a Wi-Fi password. So you look through the messages that are available offline to get the Wi-Fi password. And then you have to check the weather and that gets you the Wi-Fi password. And then you get the Wi-Fi and that gives you access to the email. And once you have access to the email, you can start seeing the other things that are being used and contacted. And then that opens up the door to other kinds of things that are locked behind other kinds of security until eventually in my quest to work out, oh, who's this phone? I wonder if I could get it back to them. I have hacked the email of a child. <laughs> and I was okay with that that far. At one point, I deduced that the solution to one of the puzzles was to send a message to someone using this phone with an attached image from the archives I had dug through. And I just couldn't do it. I stopped. I just stopped playing the game and I sat back and I stared at it and I went, what is this feeling? Wh why? Because, let me be clear, pouring through the message and email history of a young queer person is the nightmare scenario. It's the kind of thing you're afraid of an abusive parent doing. It's not good. It's not good feeling. And yet the game hadn't made me feel bad about doing any of that. Especially because it was so easy to do, even though I did punch in a password to try and access someone's dating profile. Which, again, they're a kid? Still, asking me to send the image was like a step too far, and I couldn't bring myself to do it. I thought that it was too much, so I didn't do it, and I stopped. I stopped playing the game and I got up and I had a little walk around and I took some deep breaths and I wondered to myself, oh man, oh, well, I mean, you know, maybe this is the way the story ends for me. Maybe the point of this game for me is that it made me realize just how easily and eagerly I'll invade the privacy of a child for no real good reason when really the best thing I could probably do is just lose this phone again, possibly underwater because the parents don't need to know about this. But then I thought, what if the people writing it don't stick the landing? What if, what if this game's ending sucks? So I cheated. 
I went searching for an FAQ and I tried to find what the password I needed that the sent message would get me and I did that and that was almost one step away from the end of the game and I played through that last little bit and thought it was lovely and heartwarming and all of the questions were made clear. I had a narrative constructed in my head and I was 80% right about what happened. Eh, give or take. And then you receive an email, which is actually a sent email, talking about how Sam wants out and she's hoping whoever finds her phone deletes everything on it. <laughs> 